Very good. All right, we're off and rolling. Great. Um, with so here we are. Um, welcome to the um, community table conversation. Um, we're going to hold these once a month. Really glad that um, so many of you have come to share share with us and. With historic federal funding for broadband and digital equity work on the near horizon, it is truly a pivotal time in our for our state and calls for an all hands on deck approach for sure. It is absolutely critical that we have participation from as many stakeholders as possible, individuals and community organizations, local governments, social service agencies, internet service providers, libraries, the business community, tribal members, labor organizations, and educational institutions, all here thinking about big picture ideas and weighing in on the best way for us to reach internet for all in our state. We're gonna talk um, in, a, in a few minutes about the federal funding opportunities that the ACA Broadband Office is actively pursuing right now. Those would be the Digital Equity Act and the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment or BEAD program. But first we wanna just give you the lay of the land in the ACA Broadband Office as it stands today. Um, I'd also like to ask, um, and people are putting putting questions in the chat and the, and the q and I'm gonna ask that we hold off qu questions. Oh, wait. <laughs> We can't ask questions live anyway. So, okay, all of your questions are going in the chat. We will pull them at the end of the program and, and answer them as best we can. Um, just bear with us. Um, again, this is the first, the first in the series and we're gonna have to work some of our bugs out here. Um, the Commerce Authority is the official administering entity for these federal programs in Arizona with the broadband office managing the day-to-day -day processes and timelines. Sandeep Bomek is the state broadband director. I am Cindy Hogan. I am the digital equity program manager. Lillian Lee, who is also here, is our broadband grants and compliance manager. And Crystal Severse is the broadband data GIS analyst. Additionally, ACA has contracted with the Digital Equity Institute, DEI, to help us develop the digital equity plan for Arizona. DEI is an Arizona nonprofit civic organization dedicated to improving quality of life for people around the globe through digital equity and inclusion. DEI is ably led by Dr. Erin Carr Jordan, who is here today. And we hope we will be able to hear from her in a little bit. ACA has also contracted with two national consulting firms, the KP, KPMG and Connected Nation to guide us through the requirements of the BEAD program. And the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA, is administering and implementing the Digital Equity Act and the BEAD program for the federal government. NTIA also hired federal program officers within each state to serve as liaisons to support and guide successful broadband office efforts around this federal funding. The, FPA, the FPO for Arizona is Nicole Umayam, who is also present today. And I'm gonna turn off sharing. I'm gonna give you a break from all, all that writing. Um, the ACA Broadband Office is going to hold these virtual seat at the table conversations once a month, essentially to serve as open office hours for the Broadband Office. We will primarily focus on the digital equity aspects of the two grants, but we'll be able to answer broadband questions as well as they arise. Um, the, the two programs, the Digital Equity Act and the BEAD program kind of go hand in glove um, together, they need to be they need to be very closely aligned. So it's hard to talk about one without the other. So we will be we will be um, focusing on both, but but really really um, turning our focus on the digital equity um, elements of both. This is a very big state, and we want we want to be in conversation with as many individuals and, and organizations as we can throughout the rest of 2023 and beyond. We'd like to encourage you all to think of someone 
um, maybe from a different locale from your own that you can invite to these meetings to share their perspectives. I wanna be sure that we get as much coverage across the state as, as we possibly can. And, and your help in recruiting new people to attend would, would certainly be accepted and, and would help us a lot. We want these meetings to support open two-way conversations between communities and the broadband office. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm saying that and yet I'm, I'm really confused because of a webinar, I'm not, not able to talk with you and it's, uh, um, we'll work, again, we'll work that out. We will use this time to provide, we will also use this time to provide regular updates that are coming directly from the ACA broadband office. So you're not getting secondhand information, you're getting um, information directly from us. We will likely give a brief introduction like this at the beginning of each call because we anticipate that each, each month we'll have new people joining. I really hope that's the case. I hope, um, I hope these meetings take hold and get strong and last even into beyond um, 2023 because I think it's valuable for us to be having these conversations at this time. If you've registered, um, we, we plan also to develop a list of agenda topics that we will share out before each meeting. So if you've registered for these calls, we will email you with the topic for the month and it will also be posted on the ACA webpage. We plan to keep in touch with you and let you know where to find these resources. On that same page, there is a contact us form. So you can voice your concerns, make suggestions or ask questions and we will, get, we will get back to you. We will also provide the contact us link at every meeting. And I'd like to ask um, Lillian, could you um, grab that link and share it in the chat so that everyone can, can pull it and they can continuously um, feed comments into, into the ACA through that website. We're also going to be holding in-person community listening sessions throughout as much of the, the state of Arizona as we can. We are currently finalizing the locations and dates and we will share the itinerary when it is confirmed. We hope to begin these, what we, we're calling a listening tour in June. It'll probably go through the summer. Um, so we'll keep everybody posted on, on where those are happening and ask you to help get the word out so that people know that we're, we're coming to, to rural communities, to urban communities. Um, we wanna hear from everybody. Before we get into the details of the two grant programs, I do wanna, wa I would, I do wanna talk about the digital divide digital inclusion, digital equity, and internet for all, as well as give some basic definitions, because I know the lingo can be pretty confusing, especially um, for people that, they, that may be listening in for the first time. I hope we have some people who are here today who are new to this topic and maybe are curious to understand what the fuss is all about. Um, I will try to give you some background and I will try to do it, I'll try to give you the short version. <laughs> So the term digital divide goes back as far as 1996. Yes, it was used to describe a phenomenon that was visible back then. There was a discrepancy between those who could afford and thereby adopt technologies to access and use the internet and then those who, who could not. The, the divide obviously was visible enough to be named Yet the supports and resources that could have been deployed and starting then to ensure ex equitable access to the internet or at least minimize the divide, those, those resources and supports were not deployed at that time. And here we are 30 years later, having left millions of people without this access along the way with all of the repercussions to their earning power, education and health outcomes and still 30 years later with segments of our communities struggling to support themselves and their families without the internet access or digital skills in a world and an economy that have gone almost entirely digital. I, I feel like myself, I feel like I, I, like a lot of people, got on the technology train shortly after it arrived and it, I never turned around to see, to see who was being left behind. So I personally see this new federal leg legislation is a as a deferred investment whose time at this point is well overdue. There have been many 
there have been consequences to society at large in deferring this investment. Lack of internet adoption is now considered a super social determinant of health. And poor health outcomes result in untold societal costs. It also creates or exacerbates barriers to other social and economic resources that have a material impact on broader social well being, um, access to employment opportunities, training, education, benefits, and social service programs, as well as needed social connections. Angela Seifer, the executive director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, says it way better than I ever could. And I, I never want to um, try to paraphrase something when, when I think someone has nailed it. Um, access to the internet and the skills to use it are essential not only to survive, but to thrive. And thriving is essential to America's promise, to the well being of its people, and to the country's ability to compete globally. Now is our chance to leverage federal funding, funding to sustainably and reasonably support Arizonans who want to have the opportunity to utilize online resources to improve their lives now, but they still face significant barriers to getting there. I'll also say further that Americans are forward-looking people and focusing on the next big technology that we can develop and utilize say in workforce or economic development um, efforts is exciting and perhaps more likely to grab our attention. But let's all think for a moment about the beginning of the workforce and economic development pipeline where, where the rural residents, um, individuals with disabilities, minority populations have not had the opportunity to learn 21st century job skills because they lack meaningful access to the internet. We have untapped human resources that we can bring to this pipeline with sustainable and reasonable support that will benefit Arizona's economy. In an almost entirely digital world, those who are not online literally do not have a way to participate in a dialogue where solutions to the digital divide can be explored through their eyes. The, these internet for all investments will enable everyone to have a chance to participate in the decisions that shape the communities that they live in. So back to terminology. Um, digital equity, equity internet for all, is the end goal we are striving to achieve. And digital inclusion describes the pieces that need to be in place in order to reach that goal. And I'll just read these. Um, one is affordable, robust internet service, preferably to the home, internet enabled devices that meet the, the needs of the user, three, access to digital literacy training, four, quality technical support, and, and five, applications and online content designed to enable and, and encourage self-sufficiency, participation, and collaboration. distracted there for a second. Um, so that's, that's digital inclusion. Those have been around for a while. Those are telling us what we need in place to achieve digital equity and internet for all. The most recent concept arising in the digital inclusion space I find is that of ecosystems, digital inclusion ecosystems, which means going beyond a series of standalone programs Oh my gosh, am I not sharing? Sorry, that's what happened. Okay, here we go, sorry about that. So digital inclusion ecosystems mean going beyond a series of standalone programs or activities or pieces as, as I described in digital inclusion. But to think about how holistic systems can be built where elements work together and support each other, um, it has been interesting to watch this concept start to evolve. Um, I have an example, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but for instance, if, you, if someone has a program where they provide K -8, a K-8 student a free computer, 
and they send them home without asking if they have internet service at home or without training them how to use it or without giving them a way to find tech support, that computer is very likely to become a doorstop versus a powerful tool. But if we, if we think about it as an ecosystem and start plugging in and finding a system, a systematic way to provide the different pieces that are shown here, um, that's where we start to get internet adoption on a, on a scale. So a strong digital inclusion ecosystem includes programs and policies addressing all aspects of digital inclusion. One is affordable broadband service options that meet the community's needs. Two, affordable device ownership pro programs that meet the community's needs. Three is multilingual digital literacy and digital skills tra trainings that meet the community's needs. Four, hardware and software technical support, very critical. And five, digital inclusion services, di digital, digital navigation services that guide individuals to the above mentioned services. And also very key in this ecosystem is collaboration. Collaboration between entities providing digital inclusion services, policymakers, advocates, social service providers, and community leaders can co-create solutions in partnership with the community. Um, digital navigators are individuals who address the whole digital inclusion process with community members through repeated interactions, including get, getting them resources like home connectivity, um, affordable devices, digital skills, and technical support. And I say this, I talk about this ecosystem and all the pieces, all the piece, all the five um, elements, but also the system of, of community engagement around these things that include um, policymakers and advocates and, and co-creators of solutions. One of the greatest fears of digital inclusion practitioners who have waited years for this type of funding is that we'll fund individual programs that work without considering solid, long-lasting systems change ideas supported by sustainable funding mechanisms. There are many, many worthy programs that are making great strides in Arizona, to be sure, and they, and they also need support. But at this stage in the game, let's think about big picture system changes too, while we have this opportunity. And now let's finally jump into the two grant programs that are that the ACA is working through at, at this point. Um, to start with, um, the first, firstly, planning for these two grant programs needs to be very closely aligned so that both, so both teams, we will be working very closely together, kind of fist and glove. We need to do the same extent and types of community outreach. We need to ensure that efforts between the two programs are not duplicated, that we're not providing resources or programs um, on top of each other, um, so that, so that um, money is very carefully and well spent. Um, both grant programs are focused and have the same list of covered populations. That is the, the I call them the, those who most confront barriers to digital inclusion. The covered populations for both grant programs are the same. So we're trying to reach the people again that as I described have never, never quite been reached in the same effective way. Um, so these are aging individuals, incarcerated individuals in this, in this program, other than those incarcerated in a federal facility, veterans, individuals with disabilities, individuals with language barriers who are English learners or have low levels of general literacy, individuals who are members of a racial or ethnic minority group, and individuals who primary, primarily reside in a rural area. So now you know where, where the funding is intended to reach. These are the un and underserved, the people that face the most barriers and have been facing them for a long time. And so this is where, this is where we're gonna aim most of our federal dollars. The Digital Equity Act, um, the objective is to support the closure of the digital divide and, provoke, and promote equity and digital inclusion. So that individuals and communities have the information technology capacity 
that is needed for full participation in the society and economy of the United States. The total funding pool for the entire country is $2.75 billion. To this point in Arizona, we've been awarded $1.1 million. That's part of a formula grant um, that is being used for planning, for planning and to create the state digital equity plan. Creation of the state equity plan is currently underway. And that's part, this is part of that effort, this, these meetings, and we're also the listening tour and, and we have, other, we have our other things underway, gathering data and mapping and all that sort of stuff. Um, 1.44 billion will be distributed to the states by formula opening in the spring of 2024. That's for a capacity grant. The competitive grant will be 1.25 billion to be distributed to states by opening of fall of 2024. The timelines, um, the state digital equity plan, these are loose. This is a federal program, so they're subject to change, but this is what, how we see it now. Um, including a one month public review, the completed final plan should be done September 30th of 2023. Um, the capacity grant is, has a five-year implementation process. It starts in spring of 2024 sometime. Competitive grant is four-year four year implementation process starting in fall of 2024. And the funds may be used for cover populations to facilitate broadband adoption to provide educational and employment opportunities, implement training programs, make broadband equipment and software available at little or no cost and construct or, or upgrade public access computing centers for eligible populations through community anchor institutions. I'm hearing, even in that language, I'm hearing, a, I'm hearing systems. I'm hearing um, lots, of, lots of different ways that we're gonna attack the problem um, in, a, in a coordinated way so that um, adoption is really successful. So that's the Digital Equity Act. The BEAD brought the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program. The objective is to close the availability gap, which is essentially infrastructure, as Congress finds that access to affordable, reliable, high-speed broadband internet is essential to full participation in modern life. The total funding pool here is $42.45 billion. To date, Arizona has been awarded $5 million and part of that um, 100 million, um, wait a minute, 5 million, that doesn't make sense. Oh, sorry, the, um, 5 million is part of the per state um, allotment and that's being used for planning to create the five-year action plan for the BEAD program. Um, per state, 100 million will be distributed in formula-based grants to competitively award grants for qualifying broadband infrastructure, mapping, and, and adoption projects. So adoption um, is also included in, in the broadband, um, in the BEAD, BEAD program. It has a four-year implementation process starting in 2024. And funds may be used for broadband deployment to un- and underserved areas. Unserved projects are those that lack access to um, 25 over three. Underserved projects lack access to um, 100 over 20. Connecting eligible community anchor institutions is a priority for this, for this program. Um, data collection, broadband mapping and planning, there's funding for that. And broadband adoption projects such as including and providing affordable internet capable devices. So you can, you can do some device distribution on, under this plan. So that is a simple summary. Um, I, don't, I don't expect that that gives you a whole lot of detail on these programs. Um, if, you, if you contact us, we can tell you where you can find the notices of funding and you can find um, more information about, about these programs. Um, more will be revealed as these meetings go along. And um, I'm not, you know, I had planned to be able to turn this over to, um, 
Sandeep is not able, was not able to join us today, but I was going to try to turn this over to Dr. Carr Jordan, and I I don't think we have the ability to do that. Um, we actually do. Cindy, oh, so, oh, great! Um, I am going to unmute her right now. Oh, perfect! You guys have been working behind the scenes. Great! <laughs> Thank you so much. Take it away, Erin. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have no way to show my camera uh, or to turn this off. So uh, I think it's probably best that I just say hello uh, okay. and express sure. my gratitude that everyone made time out of your incredibly busy days to come and participate in this first session and to get access to this information, which is tremendously important. Hopefully this creates a place that gets us to level set. Now we can do the hard work that is lots and lots of listening and seeking to deeply understand the experiences of folks that are happening across our beautiful state and understanding how we can leverage the resources that are coming into the state for the benefit of the communities. Cindy referenced that we are about to undertake a listening tour. Uh, we would love to invite you to participate in that. We have 20 sessions, uh, Cindy referenced, they're going to be all over. We're stopping in every single county. Uh, we want to invite folks from community anchor institutions, which I believe is the majority of people who are here, which is just wonderful. So if you're a community anchor leader, that doesn't have to be by title, that's just by someone who makes decisions or someone who just wants your voice to be part of this conversation. You are invited to join us. Your voice is the ones that we want to hear and you should be driving these conversations. So the first stop I believe is actually in Flagstaff on June 5th, we'll actually send out the information, but we would like to ask a favor of you. The way that we would love for these sessions to run is two parts. First, we want to hear from anchor institution leaders because you're doing work with the people who should be the drivers of this every single day. And the experiences that you have in collaboration among the community with the community uh, can't come from anyone else uh, but you from that capacity. That being said, it's equally important that the community members themselves be part of the conversations and that their voices be reflected in the planning process. So we'll have two sessions in each stop. The first will be for community anchor leaders. And then the second session in the day will be for members of the community. And the favor that we have to ask is once we uh, help people to help people to know, <laughs> once we release the dates of those sessions, if you could, in your respective areas, make sure that the people uh, who need to be at those events are invited, that they're aware, that they know that the invitation is open, we'll have food, we'll create a warm and receptive environment, we will be listening, not talking. Uh, and the hope is really that throughout this process, they become empowered in this space and they really do feel that they are reflected in the decision making and the prioritization uh, and that we recognize that their time is valuable and we're not building this for anyone. It is really intended to be with. And if we build it any other way, it will not be something that's useful. So that is what I would love to add. Uh, also, we will begin to collect information. We would love your participation in that. Please, when you get the link, feel free to share it. It's important to share that those data are, excuse me, anonymous. Uh, it is intended to get a diverse and full representation of what's happening across the state. So feel free to share from an honest lens. The hope is that over time we build trust with you, that we create a safe space for both you and for members of the community. So you feel like you can share what's really going on and we can really get to understand the things that are making it harder uh, so that we build things that make life just a little bit easier. And as Cindy referenced, so that everyone has equal opportunity to thrive. So thank you for inviting me today, and I look forward to talking with everyone on the road, in the community, and in any other way that you want to reach out to us. Uh, and if you haven't received an invitation for uh, a phone call or an in-person meeting, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we absolutely want to make sure that we're doing that in addition to all of these specific sessions. Thanks so much, Erin. That's a great, great bookend. Thank you very much. Um,
We would sure love to be able to have you guys raise your hands and ask questions and try to have some sort of dialogue. Um, so Lillian, if they raise their hand down below, how do we know who it is and how do we call, how do we unmute them to talk to them? So um, you can go ahead and use the feature raise hand and I can unmute you for you to freely speak. Um, if you do not see that feature or don't have that feature, you can just pop in the chat um, asking for me to unmute you. So and yeah, anybody And you can also continue to just use the chat feature like you have been. And I've checked the chat. I haven't seen, oh, look, they're saying, okay, good, this works. Great, go ahead. I think I was un unmuted. Can you can you hear me, James? Yes, Christian? we can hear you. Yay! Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, James Christian with AT and T. I'm just wondering how best uh, you know uh, private companies like like mine can help in this endeavor. It sounds like on the front end, this is going to be more community listening, so there won't really be a role for us there. But how how do you envision us engaging with the broadband office going forward? Well, I'd be happy to have you. Like I said, um, I think I think Lillian put the the link to uh, the like the contact the broadband office. I'll I'll, I'll move it forward in the chat to make sure it's um, still visible. I think. Um, I would say. I mean, I have providers contact me, contacting me all the time to ask for meetings, and I'm happy to I'm happy to do that. Um, so so contact me through, and I can put my email in the chat too. Um, contact me through the the contact form on the broadband um, on the web page, the ACA web page, and um, I'm happy to meet. What what we're you know part of. Part of, especially part of the Digital Equity Act, we're very interested. I know I've had a lot of meetings with providers who are sharing with me what they are doing currently um, with community members um, to to do digital equity and digital inclusion work. You know, whether it's whether it's do, doing donations of hotspots to um, the boys and boys and girls club, or you know, different things like that. Whatever you're doing, whatever you have going, we would love to hear about it. Um, and we, we do want to encourage everybody to be part of this effort. I think that's how we're going to get this done. So happy to, happy to, I'm going to put my email in the chat right this minute. Thanks, James. Hey, everybody. This is Mariana. Can you hear me? Hi, Mariana. Hey. Um, so I'm from AZ Strut, Arizona Students Recycling Use Technology, also from Aiden, Arizona Digital Inclusion Network, also from Partners Bridging the Digital Divide. So yeah, lots of stuff. So excited um, to hear all of this and see so many people working on this. Um, my <clears throat> question, concern, idea is around the community listening sessions. So um, I don't know, Aaron, if you would like to um, talk about this or Cindy or whoever wants to talk about this, or if you want to take it offline too, that's, that's fine. But um, two things, basically, um, I would love if we are engaging the community that there are resources and immediate possibilities for digital inclusion available right then and there. Um, I, I believe we might have the talent and uh, power, power, work power, people power to do that. Uh, and then also, I'd be very curious hearing about follow up um, as uh, recently attending the Net Inclusion Conference, I went to several presentations that talked about community input and how important it is for community to see their input and be able to um, like respond and uh, develop their input. Love it, Mariana. Thank you so much. 
Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know if Aaron um, is ready to answer, but that I, I mean, I think those are great suggestions. Um, they should absolutely be part of what we're doing if, if we have the capacity. I know we're gonna be driving long distances with an entourage and, and there are a lot of moving parts, but um, I, 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 I think there is possibility, especially if we reach out to partners like AZ Strut and, and others. Um, also, um, I think follow-up is really key. That is how you build trust is, be, is that you, when you say you're gonna get back to people or, you, or you've, you've, made, um, you've made the effort to, to reach out that you, that you contact back and, and give updates on, on where you're at, yep. Do you want me to jump in? Happy to. Sure, please, please, please. Yes. Sure. So uh, I really appreciate the suggestion and uh, I would love to take back to the internal team and talk about what is potentially possible and what's outside of the, the bounds of the planning uh, and, and what we can and can't do, because I think it's important to make sure that we remain in compliance with NDI and TIA. Uh, that's not a great answer. I recognize that, but it's, the, <laughs> but it's probably the best one. Uh, the feedback loop piece becomes the, the flywheel. It's the most important component of this. We would be uh, behaving in an extractive and transactional way if we showed up, began conversations with community, said we were going to listen and then didn't hear or come back. And so uh, it's absolutely essential that this first time when we're going to communities that there is a mechanism by which they can reach us, any modality that's available to them. And then we also have uh, ways for people who don't have access to the technologies to reach us using other modalities. Um, so the feedback loop is imperative. Uh, the, the point is made and heard about uh, ensuring that community feels reflected in the plan. So it absolutely will be made available to the community before it is published or submitted. It will be made available in multiple languages. Uh, and we will happily walk people through it so that so that they understand how it was uh, drafted. Uh, and hopefully, I mean, if we're doing our jobs well, this is the, the thing that I say with my community or with my my team. If we do our jobs well, people will see and hear themselves and feel themselves. There will be a sense of belonging in the document that's drafted because it just happens to be words on paper. But the words on paper will be part of the experience that they have been part of. They will see. Uh, the unique needs of their individual communities highlighted, spotlit, uh, and it will be a narrative that story tells how things are right now and how we hope them to be in the future, giving interventions that, that are proposed and interventions not in an icky sort of way, but rather um, solutioning collaboratively. Hopefully that answers your question, Mariana. Yeah, I appreciate all the... Um all that information and look forward to to seeing all of this in action for sure and and just back to the resources you know i know of course <laughs> you're you're facing a lot of um i don't know regulations restrictions whatever rules mm -hmm. um but at the same time i think that uh we can also make the best use of people's time um in you know out out in the community and um trying to piggyback with something some resources you know that are related to digital inclusion maybe not at the same time but at least uh close or um promoted would be great sure thank you that's all thanks um, I, I just there's I'm going to answer a couple things in the chat and then I know I see, see there are some folks with hands up so we'll, we'll get to you. Um, the first one is Mikhail asks, is asking for clarification. He says he doesn't believe the state will be administering the DEA competitive grant program. Um, I, I didn't understand that to be the case, but um, could either Nicole or Aaron um, answer that for Mikhail? I'll turn to Nicole oh, as looks she's like you get unmuted automatically. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, Mikhail, you're correct. So okay. there's actually multiple, it's 
three different grant programs under the Digital Equity Act program. Right now, the funding that the state has received is their digital equity planning money. Um, that's the funds Arizona got a little over 1.1 million to engage in this planning effort. They selected uh, the Digital Equity Institute as their contractor um, and are building up staff. So that's this period that we're in. That five, the digital equity plan that is produced is the requirement for the state to then apply for the capacity grant, the digital equity capacity that is available to states that complete this plan. There's also the digital equity competitive grant that's available um, for tribal entities, for local units of government, for nonprofits, for some state agencies, um, not LEAs specifically, but some consortiums and education entities um, could apply. So that's the competitive pot where applicants are, you know, not just going after the same funds for Arizona, but on a national level. So it's three grants um, all under this Digital Equity Act banner. The, the Commerce Authority um, would be administering their project funds through the capacity grant, but not the competitive grant. Interesting. Yeah, I'm sorry. I got that all wrong. I appreciate that question, um, Mikhail. Thanks. Thanks for helping to clarify that for the whole group. Excellent. Um, Mauricio asks, is there a calendar for upcoming road broadband road shows, including flyers for promotion? We we will um, we will get that. If you're registered on this list, we're going to keep you in touch with all this stuff. So yes, we will get those distributed the way that um, uh, the way that we think best um, when the time comes. And thanks for the question. Um, Monserrat is asking. Who is working on the writing of the digital equity plan? Um, Aaron Carr Jordan with the Digital Equity Institute is the consultant slash contractor for to develop that to develop that plan in concert with the ACA um, office, the broadband office of which I'm a part. And so the, it, it's, it's a group effort. We're all working on the writing of that plan together. The road, you know, these meetings and the the um, listening tours are also that we can hear the needs of the communities and try and suss out what, what's needed where and make that a part of the digital equity plan. So that's how communities can be involved as well. Um, and like I said, there's ways you can contact us through the website. You can e email me directly, Montserrat, whenever, whenever you have something. We can, I can come down and do a listening event just in, in Tucson if, the, if that makes, makes sense. I, I think it does. I'm, I'm happy to um, accommodate as many requests like that as, as I can. Um, Aaron, a, a question. Um, they Montserrat would like to know will the digital equity plan be available in other languages yes awesome that's great um and the the plan gets implemented i believe through the grant through the grant um process that follows whether it's com competitive or, or capacity um nicole or, or um aaron do you want to do you want to tackle that one? How will the digital equity plan be implemented? I will turn to Nicole. She's okay. representing NTIA. I'm happy to answer, but I think these kinds of questions are, are better More responded to. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yep. Yeah. I mean, Ultimately, this is um, the digital equity plan that the state is working on is the broad vision. It's identifying all of the barriers. It's um, really digging deep into specific populations, you know, the way that Cindy described earlier. And it does outline some steps that, you know, are are determined through this, this process of engaging with the community and listening to what the needs are and learning who all the players are. Um, so in that sense, the plan does, you know, does sort of provide an out, outline of what could happen next. 
um, and I didn't, didn't find those players, um, as the state applies for the capacity grant, that's where the rubber hits the road and they'll, the, the state then says, okay, we know that these partnerships, these programs are successful or we've, we've identified needs for them in our planning process. Um, the, the state is then deciding where that funding would go, whether that a piece of it is creating their own subgrant program that they would then make available to practitioners and uh, providers and you know education all you know it's that becomes the the spending plan there so ultimately it's all gearing up towards that bigger pot of money that will also go to the state for um, for this process but that's why this planning is so critical that we're hearing from people on the ground, we're hearing from the existing programs and those dream programs, because where that gets funded is, is through this capacity grant to the state. So I hope that's not too vague. Um, ultimately, what they're creating in the plan isn't necessarily where the dollars are gonna go. Um, that's what gets determined in their capacity, um, you know, but, they have to point back to this plan on why they're making those decisions for the capacity grant. Okay, um, I've got to cut, I'm gonna cut off questions there because I think we, we um, I'm gonna answer what's here, but I don't think we can take any more because I wanna be fair to. So um, Lillian, could you unmute um, Fernando Roman? So he can ask a question, he's got his hand raised. Yes, thank you very hey, much. Yes, mm -hmm. thanks for everything you've been doing in regards to digital equity. Um, I, you know, you and I both have been doing a lot of, in regards to the emergency broadband benefit, mm -hmm. uh, the affordable connectivity program. We've watched that program grow. Um, and unfortunately, and fortunately, uh, 18,027,117 people are on the plan now. That just shows the need for that. And I, I'm hoping that the state of Arizona is having conversations with the federal government about how to refund the affordable connectivity program because the monies won't last forever. That being said, um, equality means affordability. Uh, you, we can take fiber optic internet, fixed wireless internet, 5G internet to every resident in Arizona, but if they can't afford it, that's gonna be a problem and we're gonna be in the same situation. So what type of higher level conversations are we having in the state of Arizona with providers and the federal government to make sure that there is access to quality, reliable fiber optic or internet uh, to everybody. Right, and I, I, I can't answer that question. I don't, I don't know where those, where and if those conversations are happening. I know, I know the National Digital Inclusion Alliance is constantly, they were in Congress the other day um, lot, you know, trying to trying to make the case for for um, refunding that ACP. Um, so I'm going to take down your question, um, Fernando, and and find that out for you, and um, certainly make some motion in that in that direction. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask um, Aaron. I'm gonna ask you to hold on one second. Um, our, we have a question from RJ Husky um, about our tribal communities included in the road tour. Also, how are these plans full unfolding or yeah, unfolding in tribes? That question I think is for you, Cindy. Okay. The governor's, the governor's office is leading the tribal consultations. Right, right. But certainly, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. So, so yeah, I, I think what happened was the, the, the governor's office, uh, office wanted to be very careful about tribal, about tribal communication and, and protocols and being, being sure that we're being real sensitive to the, to the, um, the, the best approach. I think what's happening is the governor's office is going to be hosting the what is a required tribal consultation um, that's required by the federal legislation. And that's happening, I believe, on Friday. And we've all been kind of, we, we've needed to wait until that official 
um, event takes place and, and so, until we get direction from the governor's office in concert with, with tribe. So they, we, they're, that's all gonna be included um, in, in, in all of the planning and the visiting, um, but, but we, we have to kind of take our direction from the governor's office about how to do that. So it's on our radar. Um, and I maybe Nicole can answer better how plans are unfolding in tribes. I know there's an opportunity for tribes to do their own digital equity plans. I don't know how that's rolling out or how many are doing that um, or how that works. So maybe you could take a stab at that, Nicole. Yep, it's uh, it's an interesting, interesting dynamic. Um, as part of the state's plan and in their process, what you know NTIA will verify is that there was engagement with tribes for the broadband projects and the digital equity projects. The state is supposed to demonstrate that they have uh, been in contact with tribes and that if there has been digital equity planning going on that they are putting in a good faith effort to incorporate that into the state plan. Um, at this point, um, like Cindy mentioned, they're still trying to figure out what that ongoing engagement looks like. Um, there aren't really many tribes in Arizona that I know of that are actively working or, you know, that have a digital equity plan ready to go. So part of the question is how can, you know, how can the state support these efforts while being uh, mindful and respectful of tri tribal sovereignty? Their funding doesn't really, the state's funding isn't really available in that way um, or would have had to have been something started uh, much, much sooner. So it's a really good question and I'm, I'm looking forward to the consultation where we get to hear from tribal leaders directly. So that's a government to government relationship where we'll hear from tribal leaders directly on how they want um, that process to look rather than the, right. sorry if I'm got some background noise here, but um, that's about it. But RJ, that's a great, great question. Very, very much so. Thank you. Um, before everybody goes, if you would click on the link that we just put in the chat, there's a survey. We just want to get a sense of the organizations that, or the kind of sectors that you all work for. So we get a sense of who we're, we're having on these calls. Um, if you wouldn't mind filling that out. We're, like I say, I'm hoping this, this process gets a little more simplified and elegant, um, but it's been a little choppy today. I appreciate your patience. Um, there was one more question. Um, Erin, do you want to go, Erin Lorandos? And I think she needs to be unmuted. I'm already unmuted. Thank you so much. Oh, very good. Thank you. Yep. First, I want to say thank you so much for creating this space. I think it's um, a very important uh, step in the process, as you're all well aware. So I just want to thank you for that um, opportunity. Uh, my question may have sort of already been answered, but I, I would like clarification. If we find ourselves in spaces where we are speaking with people and potentially hearing uh, questions, concerns, anecdotes, etc., what is the best way to translate that back to you? Would you prefer we use the contact link, an email? Can I just call you? What would you prefer? <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't okay. matter to me. I I will answer whatever whatever way you um, are choosing to be in touch. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Um. And I know I'm Edie. I don't know if Edie's still on, but I I did see the question about the acronyms and yeah, it's it's rather fraught. But I will um take my slide deck and put it into um put it into um, an email to people who have registered for that. So um, we'll, we'll be keeping in touch with everybody. Wow, this was a great turnout, great conversation. Um, keep it coming, um, invite your friends. Um, and if, if there were any glitches with this or suggestions about how to do these meetings, you can let me know that as well. Um, we really wanna make this effective and useful for you. Um, uh, worth your time, et cetera, et cetera. So thanks all for coming and um, we will see you in a month.